Hello everyone, uh, welcome to XPF from the Islamic University of Gaza. This is Rifat al uh, Ariel from the English department. Uh, excuse my voice, I also have a little bit of a headache. So I'll do my best for this very significant, very important part of uh, Shakespeare and part of Hamlet. Uh, Act uh, 3, scene 1, uh, said to be the longest uh, uh, scene probably in Shakespeare, not only in in Hamlet. <clears throat> the scene itself was divided into several things with uh, the introduction of two new characters, Hamlet, uh, childhood friends, uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Uh, Hamlet toying with and making fun of Polonius, uh, uh, Ophelia's father, and also uh, the, the fact that a group of players, of actors, uh, a troop of actors are coming to Elsinore uh, and Hamlet planning something uh, for something to come. And he ended one of his interesting couplets saying uh, the, the play is the thing. The, the, the idea was to perform a play on the stage in front of the king and the queen and the you know important people in Denmark. And uh, the play mirrors what Hamlet was told by the ghost. Remember, Hamlet was, the ghost was honest, but now maybe it is the devil, you know, to, to, to condemn me. So I have to double check. I have to be certain about, about that. I need evidence. I need concrete evidence. <clears throat> and the evidence comes in the form of literature. Hamlet tells us in a very romantic way that, uh, uh, that people with conscience, that people can be uh, exposed by literature, that people can be changed, radically changed, can confess if faced with some kind of uh, uh, performance in front of them. So he said, the play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. It's very interesting because it's cute of Hamlet, very dreamy, very romantic. And at the same time, I love the use of the word thing, which is a very unpoetic word in a very interesting situation here. So the play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. You will be amazed how many of these brilliant sound bites and expressions and idioms from Hamlet, particularly from Hamlet, are used everywhere, sometimes appropriated. So you will always, and many people, and that's, that's the interesting thing. And into, from today's speech, soliloquy, to be honest with you, there are, I don't want to exaggerate, but at least 20 expressions can be used, can be heard constantly here and there. And it, it would be, if you are a translator uh, uh, and you don't know these things, you will be doing a really, really bad job. Uh, and, and, and that's why, again, studying literature, studying Shakespeare, studying those texts and reading the texts, please. Stop doing what many students do, reading summaries, reading analyses, and that's it. Read the text, go through the text, even if you don't understand all of it, it's okay. And then you try to read, not a summary, you read the analysis, commentary, some critical thinking, and try to have your own opinion. Don't copy paste others' uh, opinion. So, uh, uh, and then the plan was to, uh, for uh, Polonius to lose his daughter. And again, remember how he didn't even mention her name, Ophelia. I will lose my daughter to him. To Hamlet, and uh, the, the plan was to, to eavesdrop, to spy, to see what Hamlet would, how he would react. Again, because the king is not, he was uncanny, he was diplomatic. For God's sake, so far we, we know that he killed, he is responsible for killing the king. So he is a man, and he remarried, uh, uh, he married the king's uh, a widow. So this is a man of great planning, a great planner, as a matter of fact. He also wanted more evidence that Hamlet, Hamlet's transformation, Hamlet's change, Hamlet's lunacy is or, or you know, he wants to, 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 to be certain himself for himself. And this tells something about what he thinks of Polonius. Probably he, he praised him as the father of good news, but maybe he doesn't trust him 100%. So he, they, they, they spied on Hamlet, spied on, uh, on Ophelia, and the interaction we examined a little bit, I'll come back to this in a bit at the end of this session. The interaction between Hamlet and Ophelia 
was heartbreaking. Just to say the least, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching. Two beautiful people, two amazing people, two people who are suitable, two peas in a, in a pod, like they say. They're very much suitable for each other, Hamlet and Ophelia. How they are separated, how they are, you know, destroyed. How each one is used to destroy the other. How the submissive is meek, fair Ophelia used by her, her father, her brother, and also the king. And the queen didn't say anything. They didn't protest. And Hamlet doesn't, again, justify what Hamlet did. Hamlet's harassment, Hamlet's uh, violence, Hamlet's rudeness, Hamlet's impoliteness cannot be justified under any circumstances. You have no right to deal, to treat anybody like this. You have no right to deal with a woman like this. If she says no, she, say, she says no. But again, we could understand his frustration here. He's being isolated. He lost everything, everything. Only the arrival of those group of, uh, you know, actors, you know, brought some kind of life and and we jumped we didn't examine the the soliloquy to be or not to be because this is uh, what we are going to do today and we've seen how the king decided to send him off to england okay okay because madness in great people shouldn't go unwatched and and polonius earlier said that though this be madness there is method in it there is there is method in his madness and the king said even if this is madness he must be watched. And again, Polonius promised after the performance to go and spy on Hamlet again and hide in his mother's chamber, in Hamlet's mother's uh, chamber and spy on Hamlet ag yet again. Interesting. So <clears throat> uh, I'll share the screen with you. Uh, can you see the uh, to be or not to be? We do. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'll, I'll read this and I'll uh, do some commentary and some analysis. And then at the end, I'll ask some of you to read extracts and uh, read part of their translations, those who posted me. <clears throat> to be or not to be, that is the question. With that is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them to die to sleep no more and by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to the consummation devoutly to be wished to die to sleep to sleep, a chance to dream, aye, there is the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us a pause. There is the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the laws delay the insolence of office and the spurns that patient merit of unworthy takes when he himself must his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience doth make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sickly or with the pale cast of thought and, enterpri thought and enterprises of great pith and moment. With this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Interesting. Uh, it's highly metaphorical. Some might not get lot of what Hamlet is saying here because of the metaphorical expressions that we're going to explain and analyze so it's it's clearer but even critics do not unanimously agree what Hamlet means by many things here so don't 
feel feel sad if you are confused if you are puzzled because he Hamlet remember he spoke about uh, the uh, what's the, the 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 expression he used this distracted glow and here he uses words like 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 puzzled we are all puzzled to die to sleep that is the question and the the the, the word be to to be or not to be is it to die to sleep to 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 live to kill to kill myself, to take revenge or not to take revenge, to live or not, to quit or no. I, some of you who translated this already explained this. They said, something like this. But remember, as a translator, you're not like, basically, that's not your job. Your job is not to explain. Your job as a translator is not to make things easy. Because if Ham, if Shakespeare chooses to say to be or not to be, he means to create some kind of confusion. If you explain this conf confusion in your translation, you interfere in the text. You could explain it, like you do the translation and later on you do some explanation and that is the question. So yeah, some say Hamlet is contemplating death, self-slaughter, which, he believed earlier that is that that was I, I think I was um, uh, soliloquy one when he said it's self slaughter, his canon against self slaughter. He believed that it's a mortal sin to kill yourself. But is this also about revenge? Is it equally about revenge? Now some critics say it could be about self slaughter. Not many agree that this is about Hamlet contemplating death, thinking about death, about killing himself, and that's it. Some people say he's thinking about taking revenge, avenging his father. Should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I kill him? Because if you kill yourself, you die, right? And if you kill the king, again, you die. So whatever you do, you're doomed. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind, and the interesting thing is here, we'll see this in a bit, is that Hamlet doesn't, like many people think that this is a very personal philosophical, intellectual soliloquy, and others say, no, Hamlet speaks for all. This is a collective one, and there's evidence here. There is no I, there is no me. He doesn't talk about himself. He doesn't mention the king. He doesn't mention his father. He doesn't mention his mother. Making this a beautiful, impersonal, collective thing that touches us all. And that's, that's one, one, one reason why this is universally appreciated by people. Whether it is nobler in, in the mind to suffer, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, of outrageous time, of cruel time, the cruelty of time. Time is cruel. But look at this beautiful metaphor. It's like a, a time, fortune, is a cruel army that is, you know, carrying arrows and slings, weapons. Okay? Should you suffer? Should you tolerate, endure the pain, the injustice? Arrows, the slings, the agony, the loss, the isolation, or take arms against a sea of trouble, of trouble, or defend, defy, resist, fight back. But you're not fighting by, back against equals. You're fighting, and, 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 and this is evidence that Hamlet is not the right man for this job, for the, the, the revenge, for killing a king. He's a student, he's a university student. Yes, he's a prince, but he's a, you know, a delicate uh, person. He is uh, a poet. He's a man of words. He's a, he's a scholar. So Hamlet carrying, trying to probably do the deed, kill the king or killing himself, is like carrying arms against not an army, not a person, not a couple of people against a sea of troubles. And a, another beautiful metaphor. And by opposing in them. Possibly you can't oppose, you can't end the sea of trouble. To die, to sleep. And then <clears throat> he moves to into, he mentions die. That's why many people think this is pure death. This is dark, this is bleak. To die, to sleep. This meaning, uh, even Shakespeare, I think, was it Shakespeare? He, who says, yeah, Shakespeare, who says, death's second self. To die, 
الموت هو نوم النوم هو ال... يعني النوم شكل اشكال الموت to die to sleep no more and by sleep we say we end heart, the heartache and a thousand natural shifts when we sleep we feel bitter about our problems about our suffering about our pain but also when we die we could end the natural again this is thinking about self slaughter so when we if if, uh, if if sleep here means death it, when we die when we sleep we end our all the, you know the natural the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to that we suffer from it's a consummation devoutly to be wished this is a wish people would love to do this that would be the best thing ever if you if when you suffer when you are in debt when you're doing a horrible job when you can't when there is no hope when you are you know you kill yourself this is something this is a wish but then he in an afterthought he goes into the other direction he says if death is easy if there are no consequences for death if that's it if there's just death and that's it if there is nothing after death then everybody is going to be killing himself so remember at the beginning he said uh, the church says self slaughter suicide is a mortal sin you go directly to hellfire it's a deadly sin and now he says everybody would be wishing for death would be ending their lives if we just die and that's it <clears throat> but now he says to die to sleep to sleep a chance to dream when we die when we sleep we dream right and sometimes in these dreams we have horrible dreams nightmares that sometimes you like spend a whole day or a whole week you can't live like you 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 you're mortified you're horrified by what you you had or what dream you had so if in ordinary sleep we have horrible horrible dreams that can change our lives that can terrorize us imagine the kind of dreams we will have when we are dead when we are really dead so there is the rab this is a, a very famous yeah i there is the rab there is the problem there is the obstacle here for in that sleep of death what dreams may come and imagine if we have horrible dreams in real life what kind of horrible nightmares we're going to have may come from the sleep of death min maut min naumat al maut and we have filled off this mortal coil wow i love this, this is probably the most interesting image here shuffle off this to shuffle, to shuffle off this mortal coil means to die but that's shakespeare for you the, the mortal coil is like the body like you shuffle something it's like you lose it or something when we when we have shuffled off this mortal coil what kind of dream look at this beautiful thing when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause and please when you recite this you have to pause here even the punctuation here is helping you again please after this before you sleep today think of the the, the, the worst nightmare you had now as a child and try to imagine the kind of horrible horrible dreams nightmares one might have when we die so must give us pause yeah the pause makes us think it makes us it terrifies us there is the respect that makes calamity of so long life that's why we endure life because what we know here we have suffering we have pain but what do we have after life we don't know so we better tolerate what what's going on than go to the unknown uh, the unknown for who would bear the whips and scorns of time again the same expression whips you know corbage and scorns of time like the arrows and slings of outrageous fortune the oppressor he, he counts he, he's telling us why he's angry the whole society is against him the oppressor's wrong the proud man's contumely the pangs of despised love unreciprocated love the laws delay justice cannot be done 
the killer is the king now, his father is dead. The insolence of office, the officials, the people around the king are all horrible. Burns the patient merit of the unworthy takes. He himself might his quietus make with a bare modem. You know, here, a very strange expression. Quietus means dead. And bare bodkin, bodkin means a dagger, a knife. There is this, should you take your own life or should you tolerate this? Do this. Who would fardels bear the burden? Want and sweat under a weary life. Why? He's saying, why, why do we tolerate life? Why do we live? Even if life is full of, you know, arrows and slings and whips and scorns and loss and isolation and injustice. But that, the, that's the answer here from Hamlet. The, the dread of something after death. And he again uses probably one of the most beautiful, brilliant metaphors of all times. Describing this likening death to the undiscovered country from whom born no traveler return. Al maut, al qariya, al makan, al balad, ghayr al muktashaf, al ladi la yaoud min hu musaf. From whose born no traveler return puzzles the world. That's what puzzles us. That's what puzzling has, making analytical, contemplative, hesitant. Because what come what, the dread of what comes after death and makes us rather bear those ills we have so we bear to bear here means tolerate not to alam. ills means problem suffering pain then fly to others that we know not of thus conscience does or does make cowards of us all if you notice i'm you know, making does or does because there's an exercise on this in a bit. Conscience. And conscience could mean conscience of Damir. In Sam Damir, yani I, I, I mostly see this quoted in the context of conscience meaning in Damir. Damir in San Japan. Japan, Lana can tell you don't do wrong. You don't steal. You don't lie. You're honest. You're straightforward. So, because you have a conscience. But conscience could mean thinking, thought. Contemplation, ta'amul, tafakkur. Or thinking could mean knowledge. If you have knowledge, if you know, you know that suicide, self slaughter is, you know, wrong, etc. You wouldn't do the wrong issues here. And thus, the native hue of resolution, the resolution to take your own life, is sickled or with a pale cast of thought. Again, he uses the word thought, thinking, contemplation. And enterprises of great pith and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. And you can't take action. I could spend hours and hours talking about this, examining every tiny little bit of, of detail here. I remember, I don't know whether I was crazy then or not. Uh, I, in one, uh, one year when I taught Hamlet, I came to... Uh, to 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 be or not to be, and I told the students, listen, I'm not going to explain this or analyze it because I can't do justice to this. I need four months to to spend on to be or not to be. So please do do it yourself, put it the way you like. I don't want to frame you. I think I was crazy. So <clears throat> I'll do some uh, uh, talking here and then see what you have to add before we go for the recitation and translation. So now. Uh, Again, people disagree how many uh, soliloquies Hamlet had so far. Some people say this is Hamlet's third soliloquy. And in our book, it's treated as Hamlet's fourth soliloquy. So it would be usually confusing when people say Hamlet's third, uh, third soliloquy, fourth soliloquy. So that's why it's better to say yeah, Hamlet's to be or not to be. Is a philosophical rather than a personal. Intellectual rather than emotional. He doesn't speak just for himself. He speaks for all, for us. It's not just an emotional outburst like he did in the first one or the second one. This, this internal philosophical debate is concerned with existence, and life and death. This is not only Hamlet deliberating self-suicide, killing himself. He's talking on, on behalf of us all. And Hamlet here 
is asking a question, not for himself, for all the dejected, the wretched souls. Is it nobler to live miserably or to end one's sorrows with a single stroke of, of a dagger? He knows that the answer would be undoubtedly yes. If death were like a dreamless sleep, if we know what happens, and the most ironic thing here is that, and that's that's why, like this confusion here, and you think this is deliberate. Uh, I I I I can't remember which lecture, which video on YouTube I watched. The one one commentator was saying that. Remember what happened before this? Hamlet took a decision to use the play in order to catch again the conscience of the king. He wanted the evidence, so Hamlet had a plan. Yes, it's too. Yani, he's he's been delaying the the, the death of, of the 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 the, the, uh, the revenge too much. We are uh, halfway through the play, but he already had a plan. At least he had a practical plan here for the first time. So this commentator was saying this is the place of this soliloquy is really strange because Hamlet was dejected, was you know thoughtful, reflective until. Uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the the actors showed up. He, he, he the 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 actors breathed life into Hamlet. So we go back. Hamlet is kind of regressing, you know, kind of hal to tetraja. sometimes he's and this could be evidence. Some people say this is Shakespeare. Shakespeare is crazy. He's not doing a good job. But others would say no. No, Shakespeare wants to present us with Hamlet that is fluctuating between sanity and insanity, between action and inaction. So here when he says, and I hope some of you noticed this, when he says, uh, the dread of something after death, خوف ما بعد الموت, the undiscovered country from whom, whose born no traveler returns. الموت, البلد غير المكتشف, الذي لا يرجع منهم مكافر. Remember, just like two acts ago, Hamid, Came to face with a ghost that very small. So is Hamlet? Is this more evidence that Hamlet is not up to the job? He's not. He can't do the job. Or is this again Hamlet fluctuating between believing and not believing? You know, to be or not to be believing or not believing the uh, the ghost. This is really interesting. So when we talk about Hamlet here, he's a thinker. He, but he's also detached a little bit from reality. He's analytical. He's reflective, unlike every other character in the play. His mother, his even his father, the dead one, the dead man, his uncle, Polonius, Ophelia. Hamlet is angry. There is anger. And he feels betrayed. We, we, we've seen this later on, how he, when, when he realized that Ophelia lied to him, he became very angry. Hamlet is a poet, right? He loves words. He's not a man of action. He loves drama. And Hamlet is a university student, he's a scholar, he's a man of education. Hamlet is a man who thinks too much, one critic says. Another critic says, I think it's Harold Bloom, it's not the, pro the problem is not that Hamlet thinks too much, the problem is that Hamlet thinks too much too well. Because he's a genius, he's the most intelligent person in English literature. And Hamlet is, is, is here, is the wrong man for the wrong task. He's not a man of revenge. Hamlet describes himself, remember, as a coward and an ass. A coward because he, is he afraid or is he just a, a coward? Or he, he, he just can't act. Why is he a coward? Because he has a conscience, because he knows, because he thinks too much, or because he thinks too much too well. Hamlet is angry, but he's also a man of logic. He's convincing us in a bit, in a way. Hamlet lives, remember, we'll talk about this later on. He lives in a modern age. He goes to university, there is science, there's knowledge, you know. The society in which Hamlet was, the society in which his father lived is transforming, is changing. His father won the war by killing the other king. But his uncle used diplomacy, used politics, sent ambassadors to Fortinbras's uncle to negotiate. And Hamid is living in this transitioning period, sometimes a very dangerous period. But again, Hamid still, and Hamid remains, Hamid is a flawed character. He has plenty of characters. 
when we talk about cellular quiz, again, we'll talk a lot about cellular quiz. It's, it's only normal, natural that Hamlet soliloquizes a lot because this is the nature of Hamlet, a person who loves poetry and words and loves to reflect on things. The soliloquy is when the person, uh, uh, the, the actor is alone on the stage, revealing his or her inner thoughts. And, and, and in many ways, nowadays, by the way, we still have soliloquies, but because of technology, we have the, old, the, the character silent on the stage, uh, in the room, wherever, in movies and TV shows. And we hear there's what is called uh, voiceover. We hear the voice coming from his mind, his head. So it, for Shakespeare, this was in part what soliloquies were supposed to be. Somebody thinking aloud. And when we think aloud, ideas flow. It's like a stream of ideas, a stream of consciousness. We don't think well, we don't, but again, because this is drama and poetry, it is, it is poetic in this beautiful way. So number one, these are very intimate, very personal, inner thoughts, inner conflicts. And in drama, this is important because the actor is in a way reaching out, connecting uh, with the, the, uh, the audience, reaching out to them, kind of help, SOS. But most importantly, we'll see this in Othello. In soliloquies, characters grow and develop. They discover themselves. They realize things about themselves that they didn't. It's not like they plan what to say and then they come to, stay, to the stage. They just find themselves alone and they start thinking out loud. And Harold Bloom talks about this in detail. He, 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 he says the best thing about, the most interesting thing about soliloquies is, is that Characters overhear themselves like we do, and they develop and change accordingly. They realize things about themselves. They understand things about themselves on the go. Uh, again, Hamlet is completing suicide. Hamlet knows that self-slaughter, like he said earlier, is a taboo. And uh, there is another reading here other than self-suicide, killing himself, is that he's contemplating murdering his uncle, the king, which again, remember, could end in Hamlet's death, which is also a mortal, uh, a mortal sin. Harold Blooms, when he talks about this, about Hamlet, he describes him as not that, he says, listen, it's wrong, it's very simplistic, very naive to say Hamlet is a play about a tragedy about a man who couldn't make up his mind. Hattabgul, it's not about a man who thinks too much. He says, it's a man about a man who thinks too much too well. So when you say he can't make up his mind, this is you when you want pizza with, you know, uh, tuna or pineapple, pineapple or no pineapple. This is not making up your mind. But thinking too much could, is interesting. Thinking too much too well is what makes Hamlet unique and interesting. Interesting note about this, look, we, Hamlet does not use the person, not once does Hamlet use the personal pronoun I or me. He uses we. So on something that this could be the royal, the, the regal we, remember? Nahnu al because he's a prince, yeah? But I don't think so. And not once does Hamlet refer to his father or mother or his uncle. So according to this critic Jenkins, he says Hamlet uses the pronouns we and us and the indefinite who and the impersonal uh, uh, in, infinitive. He speaks of us all. He speaks of flesh, his air, what we suffer. And he talks about time and fortune as something, the grand leveler, which serves incidentally to indicate what for Hamlet is meant to be. Hamlet's famous soliloquy is a universal appeal and reflects uh, this passionately, uh, this reflects this, this passionately on how tempting it is to escape the wretched human condition. We are tempted, we think of suicide once in a while, but then we remember the people we love, we remember that it is a taboo, it is haram. That what comes next could be a lot worse than what we have here. Right, I'll stop here. Uh, I'll let you uh, comment later on, but I want you to think, is this conscience, does conscience does make cowards of us all or conscience, does conscience does make cowards of us all? Can you guess those who didn't look, who didn't check? Can you guess if this is does or does? 
يعني يعني does the old English and does the uh, the more modern uh, form of the verb. Anybody? I want you to guess, and I want you to uh, tell me the difference if if you have an idea, or at least first tell me who thinks it's does, who thinks it's does. Hello. Go on. Go on, Miriam. I think it is does because he uses modern language a lot. Uh, in other words, like he uses like uh, I'm not sure like gives and so on. Yeah, he, he put s uh, rather than th. Okay. So I think. It's... But uh, do you think it does it make a difference? Remember, we, we examine thou versus you. Yeah, it may show that he is. Thou, uh, thou was more intimate, more informal. And you was more formal, more distant, more detached. That's why he used thou with Laertes and used you with, with Hamlet. So do you think there could be a, a difference here between Anybody? Any, the, the, does anybody disagree Can with uh, Mariam? Can you guess? Yeah, go on. Uh, maybe because of the rhythm or like the sound of the sentence, he uses the thus conscience doth make cowards of us all. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. that's why. Again? That is better like than does. Why? Because when you speak the language or like a uh, sorry, when you read the sentence, it like has a more um, beautiful sound than does. Oh, interesting, okay. The sound is a factor, meaning wise. Anyway, I'll, somebody, I can't see the comments here. Come on. I don't want you to check. I want you to think of a possible, you know, scenario where if this is does or does. I'll, I'll leave this for you to think, probably search for. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, most uh, versions use does, they use the word does. And some of them, few of them, fewer use does, the old form. But my question is, and I, I'll post this on Facebook, on the group, uh, does it make a difference? Is there a difference between does or does? Why does Hamlet use does here? Yeah. We'll leave this for later on. So we said this, Speech is replete with metaphors, with beautiful metaphorical languages and expressions that have become universally used, like take arms against a sea, a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. The undiscovered death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. And remember, not long ago, a figure strikingly like Hamlet's father, who looks very much like Hamlet's father, was telling Hamlet about the horrors of purgatory, about hell, the place between, you know, because he, he died untimely. If the audience can still hear the ghosts on the remote, remember me, remember me. The, 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 mem the audience can still probably hear the, ha the, the, the haunting appeal of the king, of the dead king, of the ghost. Maybe Hamlet cannot, maybe Hamlet forgot. Remember he promised, no play uses the word remember and memory and memorize like Hamlet does. No play uses the word question and questionable like Hamlet does. And this beautiful expression here, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, when we die, when we, when people, when people die. Yalla shuf. Say something before I move to the last point and then see your translations and recitation. Uh, anybody, please say anything you want to say, any comment about uh, uh, the soliloquy or any question. Yes. Voila. Yeah, so I have something to, to say. However, I'm not really sure. Uh, so like, uh, well, uh, I want you, I want yeah. you to go to the to the videos and watch them again. And I want you to count how many times you said I am not sure. It's good to be, you know, to be hedging, to be careful. But I want you to be confident, to trust your instinct, to you know, right. trust your intelligence. Okay, so 
um, I believe like many of us start blaming uh, Hamlet's mother. However, we forget that his father also is greedy, like if not even worse uh, than his mother. Like he's the reason behind everything happening to Hamlet. Uh, we've not met his father. However, he's the one who like encouraged Hamlet if he's the ghost, I mean, like mm. if the ghost is uh, Hamlet's father. So mm. like I believe he's the reason behind everything happening to Hamlet because he is greedy like his father is really greedy he caused him like he, he's now contemplating suicide I, and like i would you i would you greedy what does he want money does he want power he's dead and again i, mean, I talk about the ghost as if it is a real person by the way at least if it's not a real person even if you don't believe in ghosts we believe in characters the ghost is a character like if there is a cat or a dog in 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 the text because remember even again still if you don't believe in in ghosts this could be somebody living in the shadow of his father do you know the al-musalsal masri we live in the shadow of our fathers our parents what they say what they advise us whether bad or wrong sometimes and we suffer most often uh, uh, so you could say hamlet's father is controlling he is authoritarian you know he he likes to have the hegemony the domination, control, Saitara, even after his death. So, okay, we blame him. We, of course, we do blame him for that. Anything about Hamlet here, Reem? Uh, yes, I would ask and comment, actually. So, uh, what what does make to be or not to be the most famous? While we have, like, uh, what kind of work is a man is as, as perfect, as lyrical as this? And... I would comment on Hamlet uh, madness, or you can answer. I think uh, if, I think this one is more intellectual, more reflective, more analytical, more philosophical in a way, more profound. You know, thinking about death, and that's number one. Number two, the images here, the imagery, the metaphorical language, the poetry also, and maybe some of you might not like this, the simplicity of this. Forward. It's unforgettable. You can't yes. forget. This is, by the way, a perfect iambic pentameter. To be or oh, not to be. That is the question. I'm, not, I'm reading like a robot. To be or not to be. That is the question. So the simplicity, the fact that this is memorable. What comes la later is equally important, equally appealing also to us. It doesn't belittle anything. So if if you want, if I want to choose like. Uh, a hundred uh, best uh, quotes from all of English literature, I would choose at least five of them from Hamlet itself alone. So yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean if this is the best, it doesn't mean. And if you, if you think what a piece of work is a man is the best thing in Hamlet, you could, it's up to you. Yes, uh, commenting on, can I uh, complete? Yeah, briefly. So we give yeah, time to others. Commenting on Hamlet's madness, I don't think he's mad after this uh, perfect solo soliloquy. So a person who like proposes the the plan of pretending to be to be mad and who has uh, that much of facts about life and death and uh, life after death wouldn't be mad. But now I, I I'm ca kind of like sure that uh, Hamlet now is hesitant about the the job uh, because. I think he's a man of life. He wanted to give us as many poetry before he died, and even he wanted to to write a play. So, uh, I think he's he's uh, kind of hesitant. Okay, I think many people would use this speech as evidence, but I I, I still don't think that this is a clear cut evidence piece of evidence that Hamlet is uh, totally sane, because there, like scientifically, people could be could you know waver or fluctuate between madness and uh, sanity and insanity a seal yes doctor i think here uh, shakespeare transfer transformed to us uh, hamlet's confusion to be or not to be to take revenge or not to take revenge if i take revenge uh, i will die or like say like uh, and come at the 
We can't, uh, Asil, sorry, we can't hear you, Asil. Can you write this in the comment, in the chat, so I can read this, Mariam? Okay, I find it's interesting that we say that, uh, you know, soliloquies and reading our thoughts aloud strength our opinions and thoughts and make us determined. Uh, but here I feel like Hamlet gets more confused, especially uh, how he, he would, uh, and he will, uh, how he will uh, deal with Ophelia, Ophelia soon after this soliloquy. Uh, so you think that the, the soliloquy is not helping him? It's complicating his life? Sorry, again? Are you saying the soliloquy is not it's helping not him? Is It's uh, complicating his life? It's making his life even worse? Yeah, I think it, it makes him like confused. Yeah, and this is this is the, the nature. This is Hamlet's nature. He thinks too much. He thinks too much too well. He like something that doesn't require a lot of thinking. It needs action. Like, why would you keep thinking and soliloquizing? Because again, this is his nature. But why don't you go talk to Hamlet to to Ophelia? Why don't you do this? And many of these answers are, are questions are very interesting. But the answer is boring, unpoetic. Because if he does this, the play ends. Like a lot of us, and this is what should happen. Why don't you talk honestly and frankly to, to Ophelia? Okay, why don't you do that? If he does that, we, we're not going to have a play. Why doesn't he kill his father in act one or two? If he does that, we don't have a play. The play is going to end to, to be like of Macbeth, where the king dies in act uh, two, I think, and then everything goes to hell from, from there. So these are interesting questions, but the answers are, could be, and poetic. Ahmed, briefly. Yes, uh, I just want to comment on the soliloquy that uh, whether Hamlet is mad or not, because at first uh, I was pretty sure that Hamlet is mad because uh, no one loses his father and the right of uh, the throne and all the events that happens and stay uh, sane. But uh, what made me confused that how a mad person like uh, could say, uh, poetry or uh, like this strong language. So I don't know uh, is Hamlet is mad or not after this soliloquy. I find it also very interesting and I encourage this. Uh, I find it okay, like totally normal if you change your mind about opinion in literature as we go on. Uh, but uh, don't we usually hear of people who uh, like, uh, under anesthesia or when they are dying and unaware of the, the surrounding, they could they, they recite the Quran and they recite poetry sometimes and say very, very interesting things. We have this. So like I say, yeah, I would I, I agree if you if if in if in your exam you you're using this evidence, this um plan in the play, if using this soliloquy as evidence that Hamlet is is totally sane because he uses this beautiful poetic intellectual language with amazing logic, brilliant thinking, that is valid evidence. But it doesn't totally mean he can't like regress because after we'll see how he turns into a very angry person after this, when he realizes that Ophelia was lying, Ophelia was lying uh, to him. Before I go to your translations and dissertations, I want to go back a little bit for something uh, uh, it would be unfair to leave it, which is Ophelia's uh, 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 soliloquy. Uh, number one, we, we, we've, we've seen Ophelia and Hamlet for the first time on the stage, but sadly, many people were being, uh, uh, people were watching them. They were being watched. Ophelia wasn't herself. She was wooden. She was awkward. She was behaving strangely, and Hamlet could see that. He felt that, and that's why he asked her questions about her father, where he is, or are you honest? And he went crazy when, when she lied, lied to him. And she, she was cold, she was distant, because her, fa her horrible father is losing her to, to him, and watching her, and probably telling her what to do and what not to do, and she doesn't want to say things, you know, to, so, because she doesn't want to look bad in front of her father. She doesn't want to embarrass her, her father in front of the king. Really heartbreaking. Then 
she kind, kind of whispers in our ears as the audience and as readers now, something beautiful, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching. Poetic, it tells us a lot about herself, how she could have been the perfect wife for, uh, for Hamlet, the perfect person to help Hamlet if it hadn't been for her, her horrible brother and horrible father. And it, tells, it gives us some insight about Hamlet himself, what he was before the play began, before the death of his father. He says, oh, what a noble mind is here, all thrown. All thrown, yani, كأنه يعني أطيح به عقل نبيل أطيح به كأنه ملك يعني بخسر الملك The courtier, he was the courtier, prince, a soldier, a fighter, a scholar, the eye, the tongue, his eye, his tongue, his sword, everything. He was a man of swords. He was, his, the way he spoke, the poetry, his eye, his language, his, his beauty, he's handsome, the expectancy and the rose of the fair state. He could have been the king, the perfect king, the glass of fashion and the mold of form. The observe of all observers, quiet, quiet down, he's gone. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched, and I'm a Truta, man, Huta, man, Kuba, something like this, deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows. I loved his music. I loved him. Now see that the noble, most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled, like a bell that jangles without music, without out of tune and harsh, self, the unmatched form and feature of blown youth. Okay. Seriously, this makes me angrier and angrier every time I read, angrier at her father. But one interesting thing Shakespeare does, he gives a perfect, beautiful language. One, he gives here a feminine, some kind of feminine discourse. Uh, uh, and I say this, we'll say this many times later, this language is usually suitable for the person, for the situation, for the state of mind of the person. When Hamlet was acting crazy, he gave him more prose. Yeah. When Hamlet was poetic alone, when he would soliloquize, he, he would give him poetry. Uh, the king speaks the language of kings. The queen speaks the language of queens. The, the guards, the soldiers speak the language of uneducated, usually illiterate people who don't know language and poetry and you know verse. And here he gives her beautiful language, a language of woman. If you analyze this from a discourse point of view, you will find the words like she referred, yeah, using the word, words like rose, probably glass, what other words, ladies and honey, and probably music uh, vowel, sweet and sweet bells. And these words could be analyzed in this sense. Shakespeare is giving her the language that is suitable to her. So we remember also that she is being used and abused by her father. We also notice the interesting flowery feminine language that she will always be repeating again and again later on. And again, we have a, a rare insight into Hamlet before the death of his father. He was the courtier, he was the soldier, and he was the scholar. <clears throat> right, for an... Uh, Again, another question I'll be asking on the Facebook group is, what is it that has made Hamlet delay the, aven uh, the avenging, uh, delay the avenging, delay avenging his father or his father's death? There are several reasons. Why did Hamlet not take revenge so far? I want you to talk about this later on. Five. Uh, so we have here four uh, sections. One, two, three, four. I want four people to read this. People who didn't probably read last time. Uh, uh, who's this? Uh, the trans I, I want people who are not going to read their translations. Who's this? Whose translation is this? Whose translation is this? It's mine, doctor. Okay, it's so mine. no no recitation for Ahmad because he's, re he's going to read part of his translation. Whose translation okay. is this? Quickly, whose translation is this? Or this? Five, one. Whose translation is this? No one, where are you? I translated, but uh, mine is not here. 
Whose translation is this? Whose translation is this? Uh, me. Tayyip. Okay, so no, no reading for you. you. You read just an extract from your translation. And finally, whose translation is this? It's mine. Who's that? Dina Dabon. You, uh, I want you to, to choose a, a section of this and read it after we read the soliloquy. Who wants to read uh, section one? Iman. Section two? Yes. That. Yes, doctor. Very well. Section four? Part four? Anybody for part four? Anybody for part, uh, part three, part four? I can, doctor, if you want. No, oh, other than Ahmed and Kelsey. Okay. I, uh, Iman, I want you to read part one and two. And Dirwa, I want you to read part three and four. Go on, Iman. To be or not to be? That is the question. Without this noble in the mind, to suffer the slings and arrows. Outrage of fortune ought to come against the sea of troubles and by opposing in them to die, sleep, no more, and by a sleep to say we in the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that pushes out of this consummation devoutly to be wished to die, to sleep, to sleep with chance to dream. I, there's the love. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled of this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the speck that makes calamity of prolonged life. Okay, I find so this very... Tell the words of cons of time. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. That's really good. You need to keep practicing. I know when you are alone, when you are recording this, some of, if you want, uh, anybody, if you want to record any dramatization or recitation of any speech or soliloquy or dialogue, even feel free to do so. Upload it to YouTube and send uh, the link in the, in the replies like your friends uh, did. Okay, uh, next part. Rewa, go on. Yes, me. For who would pair the whips and the scorns of time? The ropes are wrong, the proud man's continually. The bangs of despised love, the laws delay, the insolence of office, and the spurn that patient merit of the unworthy takes. When he himself might his quietness make with a bare bodkin, who would fardels be the gr to grant and sweat under weary life, but there the dread of something after death? The undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, puzzle the world and make us rather be those elves we have than fly to others that we cannot off. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sickled o'er with the bell cast of thoughts and enterprises of a great bitch and moment. With this regard, their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Okay, very good. Also, you uh, you did a very good job, both of you. I think with more practice, with more listening to actors, with Mel Gibson or other people doing this, you can improve a lot. And you can start from easier ones. If you think uh, what a piece of man, what a piece of work man is, is easier, you can go for that. Okay, Ahmed, which part of this, of your translation do you want to read? The first part or the uh, second part? Uh, it's okay uh, for me. The read first, the first part. Okay. Akun aw la akun, hadhi hiya al-mas'ala. Ayakunu al-aqlu asma wa anbalu li tilka al-mu'ana. Amar rafi'atu wa sihamu lati tubdi al-thara' al-fahisha wa al-shani'a. Am hamlu al-silah. ومواجهة بحر من الكوارث ضد السارقين والمعتدين لإنهائهم والرغبة في الموت الرقود ولا شيء أكثر من ذلك وإن كنا عند الرقود نكون قد أنهينا الآلاف من صدمات القلب 
والآلام التي تعصف بالروح فإنه فإنه لغاية ينشدها المرء بصدق شديد لأموت لأرقد وربما يتخلل سكونك أحلام يا إلهي إن الأحلام التي يمكن أن تزورك عندما يلفك الضريح لهي عقبة لعقبة نوم الأموات لذلك يجب أن نتوقف أن نتأمل أوكي okay, thank you أحمد uh, anybody wants to comment on something that you liked or you want أحمد to improve <clears throat> briefly go on I just declared I didn't raise my hand ah, okay you there is a difference. yeah yeah I think I think this is a good translation and I like it most because clearly Ahmad didn't plagiarize it or copy it from the internet you'll find tens of dozens of translations for this but I want you to be you to work. Copying is the easiest thing, but you're tricking yourself. And I can tell that this is Ahmed's translation. It's good. It can be improved. And there are things that can be fixed. The first, what is the key issue for translation? I'm not going to talk a lot about translation, but you can't translate if you don't understand. You need to understand the text. If you don't understand the text, you need to go and read about the text. And you're lucky. Shakespeare's the text probably Shakespeare's texts are the text with most you know writing and analyses here and there and commentary. But شوف أحمد هان ما ما فهمش جملة هي ال اللي ال outrageous fortune the are the slings and arrows slings the مغلاع arrow سهام مش الرافعة تختلف عنها فهان ليست fortune ما هي ال اللي هي ال السراء لطيفة بس فيك إذا جبتها سراء فاش فاحش وجبت من عندك شنيع لا يعني حاولت نفعل بس هي معنى هان الوقت الوقت يعني قساوة الوقت يعني مقاليع وسهام الوقت القاسي الوقت غير الرحيم الذي لا يرحم محمل السلاح ومواجهة بحر من الكوارث أحسنت برضو فيها شوية مبالغة لأنه نقول بحر من المشاكل شوية خفيفة بحر من الأمزمات من الممكن I know it's القلاع yeah. not الرافعة but for uh, you know being different from the other translations بس برضه رافعات مش كثير منافق تختلف وضد السارقين والمعتدين ايش يعني السارق والمعتدين؟ ايش النص هو بيقول؟ <تصفيق> I buy and by فيش مش موجود سارقين ورافعين جيبها انت من عندك don't add anything to, to the text that's my advice but again all in all this is very good احمد Finally, uh, Reem, uh, I want you to read the second part. Mm. This is mine. Okay, go on. Doctor, I trust it. Um, can I read the second part? Okay, go on. Uh, so, فمن ذا الذي يقدر على كبح جلدات وحقارات الزمان كظلم المستبد ووقاحة المتعجرف وعشق لم يقابل وظلم الحكام وكل تلك الإهانات المقبولة باستحقاق للضعفاء من قد يتحمل ضربة خنجر لتودي بحياته من قد يتحمل الشقاء في هذه الحياة القاسية ولكنه الخوف مما بعد الموت الخوف من تلك الأعجوبة المخفية حيث يصل الكثيرون ولا يعاودون الرجعة أبدا فلما الانتقال من كل هذه الشرور المصير مجهول لا علم لنا به ها هو ضميرنا الذي يحولنا جميعا لجبناء وهو الذي يحول إصرارنا نحو العديد من الأشياء لهباء لتغدو عزائمنا بلا جلاء Okay, you're trying to do to add some kind of interesting grimes there بس هنما هو بيقول وكل شوف It's literary translation دائما بقول منه القافية أول ضحية ترجمة الشعر ما تهتم آخر إشي حطه في بالك القافية ما تخلي القافية هي الأساس عندك لأنه صحيح مهمة it's important it helps it conveys something but the, the rhyme is not everything it's the least important yes, thing yes. to say that so when you say من يتحمل ضربة خنجر لتودي بحياته ما قالتش هو قصده هان قصده يعني when he himself might he's like how he's not saying I he uh, you know absent third person pronoun uh, might his quietus make with a bare bodkin يعني كأنه بقول إنه you could just kill yourself with a with a dagger, but other than this, generally it's it's really interesting. 
uh, go go through it again after this session with what I just said in mind, explaining the text itself, and I think you can uh, improve it uh, a bit. Mean in the end, the sound of the voice in the Yes, it's me. Dina yes, Dabon. Okay. Uh, what's your name again? Dina Dabon. Dina. Okay, good job, Dina. But let's see how Dina is the presence or the absence. That's what it is. Interesting, but she is explaining the text. As a translator, you should try to be objective, as objective as possible, as neutral as possible. But here, like in Bardo Kariba, I mean, be or not be. I've, I find this very interesting. Do you want to read the first part or the second part? Um, the second one. Okay. فمن ذا الذي يتحمل ضربات الزمن وابتهاض الظالمين وتكبر الناس وأوجاع الحب المفقود وتأخر العدل والإهانات المتكررة التي يتحملها الطيبون من الأشرار في حين يكون بمقدورهم إنهاء هذا العذاب بطالة خنجر واحدة من ذا الذي يريد تحمل الصعاب ليتعب ويشقى في هذه الحياة المتعبة ولكن الخوف مما بعد الموت ذلك العالم المجهول الذي لم يرجع منه أحد هو خوف يحير العقول ويجعلنا نفضل أن نتحمل آلامنا على أن نذهب ونعاني غيرها في عالم آخر هذه الفكرة تحولنا جميعا إلى جبناء وتجعل وجهنا المحمر شاحبا مثلها Is this all your translation or did you use the help of uh, somebody's translation, uh, Dina? I tried, but I I used the help of Google, but I tried to somehow. Okay. I want you to first to always depend on yourself. If you're translating, always give a rough draft yourself. And then you look for, use dictionaries. Try not to use others' translation. I find this very beautiful also. Very, very beautiful. She didn't use the word death when she spoke about the undiscovered uh, uh, country. ما قالتش البلد برضو البلد يعني I find what Dina did هي العالم المجهول very interesting also كمان عجبتني شو لما شرحنا إحنا conscience does make cowards of us all conscience الضمير أو التفكير وهان جاءت الفكرة هذه الفكرة كثير في الشيء تحولنا جميعا إلى إلى جبناء very good good job anybody wants to say something before we we finish Anybody? Anybody wants uh, to comment? Okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, see you soon, inshallah.